All right, I just finished chapter two of seminar 16, and I want to take a second and have a little fun with this. Say a few things about what seems to be happening in the second chapter, the second session of seminar 16. It doesn't mean what we're going to say here is definitive. It means that we're reading this seminar page by page, session by session. And here are some things that I took away from the second session of this pivotal seminar, seminar 16. First, psychoanalysis, as you've heard me say before, is a scientific discourse. It's valid, correct, rigorous, transmissible, conceptually clear, and coherent. And here Lacan is saying that the discourse of psychoanalysis is especially clear and coherent about two things, namely the cause and the effect of discourse itself. I'm on pages two and three here of the chapter. Here, Lacan is primarily concerned with the effects or what he calls the consequences of discourse. And these consequences are worth talking about, he says, for many reasons, one of which is that they can be rather obscure. Page five. What I'm doing here is I'm reading along and pulling out terms and wherever possible attaching page numbers so you can then go find those phrases if you want to. Okay, let's talk about these effects or these consequences. Um, we'll come to the cause of discourse in a moment. Uh, first and foremost, these um, uh, effects of discourse um, have an effect on structure, which on pages two to four and on page five too, you hear Lacan saying that this structure is real. And that is very important as a move that he's making here. Structure is something real. Hold that thought. The other thing he says is that um, the structure, uh, the, the effects of discourse, um, they have, um, uh, they're consequential for subjects. He says it's on page five. Um, and you get some good examples um, on pages four to six of discourses, scientific. Um, for Lacan, physics was a big one, kind of a foundational scientific discourse. Um, and says that they are consequential for subjects. They are in many ways, in many ways, the subject is an effect of discourse. Um, let's be clear. The effect of discourse on the subject is authoritative. It conditions the subject preceding the agent of its own pronouncement and transmission. <clears throat> this is summarizing from page five. What we might say is that the effect of discourse is to authorize its own subject. Discourses authorize subjects. Now, what about structure? The effect of discourse on structure is not authoritative, but apocalyptic, revealing structure as real, as infrastructure, I'm going to add, and crucially for Lacan, wildly anew. That's why I choose this word apocalyptic here. The effect of discourse on structure is to reveal it radically anew by way of what Lacan refers to in this chapter as the scissors cut. All this talk of structure marks a turning point in Lacan's thought. Prior to this point, when Lacan says structure, he means tropology, tropes, metaphor, metonymy. He's talking about language. Even to say that uh, the unconscious is structured like a language, I mean, it's kind of redundant because... Structure is language at that point in Lacan's thought. Structure for Lacan early on is something symbolic. Um, here we see something different. An understanding of structure that's not about tropology, but topology. An understanding of structure that shifts from language to materiality. An understanding of structure, very explicitly here, that is shifting from the field of the symbolic to that of the real. Note some of the moves Lacan is making. Earlier in his career, structure as language, as tropology, 
connected to the symbolic. It was all about metaphor. Metonymy too, but metaphor for Lacan is the biggie. Here, Lacan states again and again in chapter 2, seminar 16, that this is not a metaphor. He reiterates time and again that he is not speaking in metaphors here. There's nothing metaphorical about what he's saying. This ain't about metaphors. You feel me? Now, what we know about Lacan's theory of language is that it's built on that of Saussure and how it thinks about language as a differential system of signifiers. Saussure likes the signs, Lacan likes the signifiers. What they both like is the differential structure, the differential relations that go into the composition of a language. In short, in Lacan's early career, when structure is tied to the symbolic, the primary line of thought here is difference. It's around thinking differentially. Here, though, if indeed Lacan is going to shift from a structure that's connected to the symbolic of language to one that is connected to the real and materiality, it's no surprise that we also see him getting into the impossible. Now the line of thought, if we follow this, would not be about the difference, the differences that go into the production of a structure, but it's sheer impossibility in keeping with what it is doing at the level of the real. And you can see this right here on page two. The structure is therefore real. It is determined by convergence towards an impossibility in general. But that is how it is, and it is because of this that it is real. <clears throat> Page 2 is fabulous for this stuff. But it's definitely worth noting here. And it's worth noting on page 2 as well the type of materiality that Lacan has in mind. He's talking about the board on which he writes. He's talking about papers his lecture notes. He's talking about the letters and the characters, numerical and otherwise, that he's using to write on the board, on his lecture notes, to present to everyone. <clears throat> Which brings us from the effects of discourse to the question of cause. Language use as a kind of saying, which is an expression Lacan uses in chapter two here, it aims at this cause. And Lacan reiterates this also on page two. Language use, the act and the art of saying, aims at this cause. He says it twice on page two. He's really trying to drive this point home for folks. Now, this does not mean and has little to do with what a discourse is about in terms of like its content, like what are we talking about? What's the subject of this discourse, so to speak? Um, it has even less to do with how it's presented. In other words, with the form of this discourse. And Lacan is being a little bit blunt with this at the bottom of page two, top of page three. Check it out. If here I am speaking about it, if I speak about structure, if I speak about it again today, it is because I am forced to do so, because of the chit-chat in the cafes. But I ought not to need to talk about it because I say it. What I say sets up the structure because it aims. As I said the last time, it aims at the cause of the discourse itself. Implicitly, and like each and every one who teaches, by wanting to fulfill this function, I defy, in principle, that I can be refuted by a discourse that justifies discourse differently to the way I have just said it. Notice all the emphasis on saying, said, and so forth. I am repeating it for those who are deaf. Namely, what it aims at is the cause of discourse itself. That someone should justify discourse in a different way, as an expression of or as a relationship to a content for which a form is invented. There's your form and content stuff. Lacan says, well, that's up to him. But I remark then that it is unthinkable with this position 
that you should inscribe yourself under any heading whatsoever in the practice of psychoanalysis. So take your form, take your content, and head elsewhere, because psychoanalysis is not your discourse, Lacan here says. I mean even not as charlatanism. You should understand that the question is whether the psychoanalysis I am indicating here exists. And this, precisely, is what's at stake. This is an interesting move, this last part. Forget about, you know, he's taking a shit on these people who want to, you know, play at, at psychoanalysis with their forms and their contents, instead of dealing with what psychoanalysis really deals with, which is cause. That's what we learn from Seminars 10 forward, basically, is that the object of inquiry in psychoanalytic thought is cause. And we know about cause. The cause that psychoanalysis investigates is not some entity in the world. It's not an object. It's an opening. It's not a being. It's the field and the function of non-being. That's the type of cause. The buzzword for this we might use is lack. That is the cause that psychoanalysis studies. But here... All that aside, what Lacan is getting at is, does this shit exist? Does a discourse of this type, which he refers to as psychoanalytic, does it even exist? Now, if you flip back on page two, you see existence popping up again. He says, either what we are talking about has no kind of existence, or if the subject has one, I mean as we are articulating it, well, then it is exactly constructed like that. Namely, it is constructed like these things that I wrote on the board, on the paper I use. So if psychoanal psychoanalysis as a discourse on the cause and effects of discourse itself actually exists, it exists just as it's being presented by Lacan here, he says with the things he writes on the board and on the paper that he uses to do so. What, then, is the cause of discourse? Now, at the risk of putting too fine a point on this thing too soon in a seminar that's still unfolding for us, what the hell, let's just give it a try. Let's see if it sticks. The cause of discourse, I would argue, is akin to that of desire. It's lack. Now, what must be lacking for a discourse to emerge? The same thing that must be lacking logically and structurally for the symbolic to operate, namely, the real. The real is whatever is excluded, unable to be metabolized by the symbolic. The cause of discourse is a logical, structural, necessary exclusion of something. A something which relative to this discourse is nothing. Because it is the product of a no thing, some part and parcel that has been prohibited. Every discourse, in this sense, is like the big other, barred. And what about effect? The effect of discourse, and here Lacan means of true and worthy discourse, um, like the one he is articulating. Um, but he wants to be precise here. We're going to come to this because there are other discourses that suck. He thinks what he is doing does not suck. And he wants to refer to this as a true and worthy discourse. True and worthy meaning worth actually presenting, actually working on, which implies that there are many discourses that are not worth presenting, not worth working on. The effect of a true and worthy discourse is to enact a scissors cut. A scissors cut that nevertheless introduces a cut into this no thing, revealing it anew. Now, I'm not entirely comfortable with that thought, with the idea that you could introduce a cut into the real. Conceptually, I don't quite follow that. 
but I'm gonna go with it for now because I'm gonna see where this where we lead. Remember, this is all a big experiment. And what we know that makes sense here is that the field and function of this non-being, that these are some of the basic waypoints of psychoanalytic thought. Remember, it's a meontology from the Greek meon, meaning non-being. It's a study of things that don't technically exist, non-being. The discourse of psychoanalysis is a discourse on, and in order to avoid the kind of aboutness slip, I want to say that it is an inquiry into. I think that's a better way to think about this. Psychoanalytic thought is an inquiry into, and I quote Lacan, the real in which discourse itself has consequences. The real in which discourse itself has consequences. It's on page three of chapter two here if you want to check it out. What I want to suggest here is that this is not a structuralist or a post-structuralist project, but instead, as my dear friend John Durham Peters puts it in his recent book, The Marvelous Clouds, this is instead an infrastructuralist project. And I think this is a great way to read Lacan, especially in the late 60s. He is not a structuralist. He is not a post-structuralist. He is an infrastructuralist. Let me be clear. If structure, as Lacan says here at the start of 16, is real, it's because its relationship to language, the symbolic, is infrastructural, at once subtracted and excised from the symbolic, but also supportive and sustaining of the symbolic. Not unlike the Wi-Fi connection that you're now relying on, or the device that you're relying on as you watch this lecture, be it a phone, a tablet, a laptop, how about the chair in which you're sitting, the chair in which I'm sitting? These are all infrastructures. Now, there's a Heideggerian insight here, and we know that Lacan was a careful reader of Heidegger, a basic Heideggerian insight into media, technology, and society. Only when infrastructural media and technology fail, when they malfunction, or basically when they just perform otherwise than we expect, that's when we notice them. Isn't the same also true of the real? It always shows up as a malfunction, as a failure, as a disruption, as a startling, unexpected surprise or deviation from how we usually would, would expect the material world around us to, um, to unfold. <laughs> Let's keep asking questions. What makes psychoanalysis a discourse that is worth the trouble of saying. And that's how Lacan puts it again, a discourse worth the trouble of saying. What I would suggest is that what makes psychoanalysis a discourse worth the trouble of saying is its ability to correctly and consequentially articulate this infrastructural insight into the relationship between the real and the symbolic here as we're playing with it. Now, Lacan pits this in chapter two against several other approaches. He's not gonna name them, but he is gonna describe them. Psychoanalysis in this way, he says, is not hazy, like other discourses. It is not delusional, like other discourses. It is not a flutter, like other discourses. When I said at the beginning here that the discourse of psychoanalysis would be clear, coherent, valid, correct, rigorous, transmissible. These are all Lacanian terms that he's using here to describe something. Remember chapter one, where he's trying to tell us what a proper discourse would look like. And it ain't hazy, it ain't delusional, and it sure as fuck ain't a flutter. Let's ask the question again then, how? How do you say psychoanalytic thought in ways that aren't hazy, 
delusional and a flutter. In other words, if the discourse of psychoanalysis exists as a discourse on the cause and effects of discourse itself, how does it show up? If this discourse exists, Lacan says, it exists on his chalkboard. It exists in his lecture notes. And it exists as, some examples from the text, drawings, diagrams, schemas. These are right from chapter 2. Now, if you've got ears to hear, what Lacan is trying to get at is a discourse without words. Remember the epigraph to Seminar 16. Drawings, diagrams, schemas. Are these words? Words could be involved. That's not the same. He's working towards something here. Here, at the start of 16, the word for these non-words and the language that they constitute is, wait for it, logic. It's logic. Lacan says as much on page 6. And not just any logic, it's mathematical logic. Now, what he wants to talk about here, it looks like, it's kind of like an intellectual history of logic, where mathematicians suddenly discover Aristotelian logic. But logic is what he's after. Logic, Lacan tells us, is something that is detached in language. Not from language, but in language, he specifies. He even describes it as a paralanguage. Logic is a paralanguage of sorts. Now, what's at stake here? Logic is not a meta-language. It's not something apart from, above, beyond language. It's a type of language, a way of speaking that has been detached and now roams through language. Paralinguistically, from the Greek para meaning alongside, but also occasionally against. Crucially, this is going to be a language, a detachment, that has specific consequences for what Lacan says is your existence as a subject on page 7. This applies to capitalism. The logics of capitalism are consequential for the subjects of capitalism. This also applies to the university. Logics of knowledge are consequential for subjects of its marketplace. Higher education, the university, academic culture, call it what you will. At stake here, Lacan tells us, is knowledge. Knowledge is what's at stake here, Lacan says on page 10. And not just in its junction with truth, without which, Lacan says, it is difficult to speak about anything whatsoever in psychoanalysis. It's right here on page 9. Knowledge with, in its junction with truth, without which, Lacan saying it's tough to talk about anything in this discourse known as psychoanalysis without this knowledge-truth junction. You've heard us comment on this before. You've read it elsewhere in Lacan and the back of the Cree. Let's see what we can do with it here. What the fuck does knowledge have to do with all this? And whatever happened to surplus jouissance? Knowledge, Lacan says, towards the end of chapter 2 here in Seminar 16, he calls it the price of the renunciation of enjoyment. On page 10, it's a very odd phrase. The price of the renunciation of enjoyment is knowledge. Now, what this means, if we're playing with the idea of value in Marxian thought, here exchange value, is that knowledge can be exchanged for enjoyment and vice versa. We exchange enjoyment for knowledge. More precisely, 
the renunciation of jouissance, of enjoyment that Lacan is here working on, he tells us that this is also the beginning or the condition of knowledge. The renunciation of jouissance marks the condition of possibility for something like knowledge. Now, all of this is in keeping with Lacan's basic theory of symbolic alienation, of castration. There's nothing new here at that level. The real must be excluded from the symbolic for there to be a symbolic. Fine, fair enough. What matters here, what's new here, is what Lacan's working towards at the level of the university. If knowledge can be exchanged in a marketplace, a marketplace of knowledge, knowledge is a kind of merchandise, Lacan says on page 11. What else do we mean by the marketplace of ideas, Lacan would say? This is the university. The university is a marketplace in which knowledge becomes a commodity, merchandise, to be bought, sold, traded, exchanged. Now let's see if we can break this down into a couple of columns. Not because it does a great amount of justice to the subtlety of Lacan's thought, but because it helps us render it clear, coherent, and more accessible than it currently is in chapter two here of 7 or 16. Recall the classic split in Lacan's thought between modern science and the science of psychoanalysis. Modern science is founded on fantasies of unification. This comes up on page 11. Unification as a theme comes up. The modern fantasy of science is a unified theory of X, Y, Z, and so on. The science of psychoanalysis is founded on the understanding of unification as impossible. There is no universe of discourse, don't forget. In modern science, knowledge is reduced to a marketplace in which every knowing is an object or a commodity that has an exchange value. The words Lacan uses for this is a kind of homogenization, he says on page 12. The emergence of a collective and thus totally inane truth or set of truths that don't even qualify as the type of truth he's interested in. At issue here is the transformation of knowledge, we might say, into ideology. Not just a collection of commodities to be bought and sold, but an ideological apparatus. And the university is the place where this occurs. Not so in the science of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is not about knowledge, it's about discourse. A discourse without words in particular. One that is silent, dumb, stupid, mute, like writing on the board, on the page, on the wall in Lacan's lecture notes. I'm of course cribbing here from the end of chapter two, 13, when he starts talking about all this stuff. If the knowledge that modern science traffics in is ideological, the discourse that psychoanalysis traffics in is structural. Let's keep moving down these two columns. In modern science, Lacan says, we see science coupled with capitalism. Page 10, he says, they go really well together. Now, if you've got ears to hear, read this as a coupling of two of Lacan's four discourses from seminar 17. It's the university discourse in service to the master's discourse. Now we're not gonna get into the capitalist discourse. We're just gonna focus on what he's building towards here. The university in service to the master is one way to read um, uh, science in service to capitalism. On the other side, again, fast and loose, don't forget we would see the analyst's discourse in dialogue with that of the hysteric. Here as the protester, as the May 68 striker, that at the end of chapter two, Lacan tries to identify the discourse of psychoanalysis with. 
which brings us back to that question of surplus enjoyment. Enjoyment in modern science becomes wretched. It becomes perverse. Lacan's clear on this. He's stretching it out at the end of the summer, at the end of the chapter. Surplus enjoyment, in other words, becomes something exclusive and elite in university culture. It's enjoyment of knowledge as a good, but a good that is only accessible to the elite few. Now, you might read this, if you're coming out of Foucault, as not a big breakthrough, that knowledge would be associated with capital, profit, power, and the like. Notice the Latin that Lacan uses to bring this out, the translation of which is great. Not all are admitted to Corinth. Or if you like better, um, not all are permitted or allowed to go to Corinth. Raises a question for us, a question that for now is going to remain unanswered. We'll see what happens next as we get into chapter three. But if the surplus enjoyment that modern science affords subjects of the university is elite and exclusive, not all are admitted into court. What kind of enjoyment fits on the other side in the field of psychoanalysis? Is there a surplus enjoyment that plugs in there, or is it a different type of enjoyment that we're going to be looking at? Let's see where we go from there.